Well, here we are with the Greek alphabet. What an exciting place to be. This chart is pulled right from your textbook, and I want you to notice a few things before we get into actually writing the alphabet. Of course, when it comes to an alphabet, you just have these little symbols, right, that represent sounds that your mouth is making. And just like in English, we have lowercase or minuscule forms of the letters, and we have uppercase or uncial or majuscule forms of the letters. Now, in the time that the New Testament was written, documents were written with all capital letters and no spaces between words. Uh, but over centuries, it came, they came then eventually to be written more with lowercase letters and then spaces between words and some accents and punctuation and, and so on. So uh, we are grateful uh, <laughs> that we have texts that we can read that have spaces between words. Notice as well, we're going to focus in just a moment on the handwritten portion of this. But there are names for these letters, right? We don't just go, this is A, B, G, D. It's alpha, beta, gamma, and so on. Then there's a pronunciation. What, what do you, you, when you see that, that letter alpha, what does your tongue do? What does your mouth do? Your mouth goes, ah, like the A in father. And you can see in your textbook there are equivalencies given here. Uh, the pronunciation that I'll be doing in this video is a Rasmian pronunciation. It's a pronunciation that was standardized by Erasmus in the 1500s and is, is the most widely used pronunciation for the New Testament Greek. In recent years, there have been some smaller groups that have uh, been making, uh, getting more attention, making more noise, advocating both modern pronunciation, pronouncing uh, Biblical Greek the way that modern Greek is pronounced, if you were like walking down the street in Athens. And then there's also the reconstructed Koine pronunciation, it's, it's closer to modern Greek, but it's uh, looking at variants the way that the kind of spelling mistakes that ancient scribes made. And uh, on the basis of that, and on the basis of, for example, transliterated Greek into, into Latin by early authors and, and, and things such as this, there's a reconstruction of, of how, um, how, how we think, or how some scholars think Koine was actually pronounced, how the, Bibli the Greek of the New Testament time was actually pronounced. So, but because it's the dominant, by far the dominant approach, and has been for centuries, I'm going to be using the Erasmian pronunciation. And you're really going to be focusing on writing the lowercase letters, because when it comes to Greek, really, uh, capitalization as we find it in your modern Greek New Testament is really only used for a few things. It's used for the titles of New Testament books, uh, with every letter uh, of the cap of the title capitalized, like kata markon. Right, if you're looking at the top of a page, you might say kata uh, mar kata markon. Right, kata markon means according to Mark, and every letter will be capitalized. That's the gospel, the title of the gospel, Mark. Then you also have proper names capitalized like Jesus, Galilee, Jerusalem. And in many critical editions of the Greek New Testament, many of the scholarly technical editions, the beginning of a direct quotation will be capitalized, especially the, the popular United Bible Society critical edition. This is what's done. So they mark the beginning of a quotation, not with a quotation mark because that, that, that is not used, but just by capitalizing the letter. And also, in some critical editions of the Greek New Testament, it's, it's common to capitalize words that begin a new paragraph. So not every sentence, uh, but just to mark paragraphs. And that's, this is not true of all uh, readers or critical editions of the New Testament. But, but specifically, this is more typically true of the United Bible Society. Uh, that's the, the if you, you see a red, <laughs> one with a red cover that looks all scholarly and technical, that's probably the United Bible Society edition. And so these, these are the kind of uh, capitalizations that you'll generally find there. And so you're, you're, you are usually going to be writing Greek in lowercase letters and reading Greek in lowercase letters. So that's what we're going to focus on here. I've written out some straight lines for us to work through this, and we're just going to I'm not a good singer, and we'll put a we'll put a link to a better song. But I'm going to sing because I love you, and I want you to learn Greek, right? And I'm going to write it. So we begin with alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and I'll write them here. And you can, of course, rewind this and watch it again. So it's alpha, 
beta, gamma, delta. And I want you to see that I very intentionally dip below the lines in some places, right? That's the way these letters are written. I also will have some students tell me, well, those look, those look different from, you know, these letters right here. Like when I look at these, it looks different from the way you're writing it. <laughs> well, I want you to get a newspaper and I want you to print out the same words that are in the newspaper. Does your handwriting, even very good and standardized handwriting, differ from uh, like a printed font? Of course it does, right? So I just want you to know I am writing these in the way that that my Greek teacher taught me 25 years ago. That's a very the very standard way of handwriting Greek. Okay, so this is the standard handwritten form of Greek. So it goes alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And I want you to note that, that each one of these has a sound that goes with it. And you just have to program your brain, right? Yes, you need to be able to write out the entire alphabet like this in order, absolutely, uh, on your next quiz. But you also need to just be able to, when you see this alpha right here, you need to be able to say like ah, as in father, just ah. And the beta, you need to be able to say like a, a B, like an English B, b b and a gamma like a g, and a delta like a d, right? And then we're going to start putting these together, right? You'll be, we'll learn to, <laughs> just like hooked on phonics, you know, right? So we look at this, it's ba, da, god, ba, da, god, right? That's not a Greek word, but you're, you're, you're learning this is a b sound, this is a d sound, this is a g, and you're just sounding it out, ba, da, god, or you could, we could do, Da ga ga ba right da ga ga ba right and it's just it's just forcing your tongue to make the sound that you're programming it to have. Let's keep going here. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta. All right, let me write that theta again. It's a little bit messy. Theta, right? Epsilon, zeta. Eta, theta. I also want you to note these are intentionally dipping below the line. That's how they're written. And we're, we now have two vowels. I'll hi highlight these vowels with the green highlighter. And the epsilon is pronounced like the uh, like an E in met. So it's pronounced E. Eh. The zeta is pronounced like a, a Z or a D Z, like a Z or a DZ sound. The eta is also a vowel. It's pronounced like the A, Y, and May. It's A, A sound, an A sound. And the theta is like a TH. So, again, we could just, let's practice these. Just say, uh, say after me. A, A, B, G, D, E, Z, A, TH. Right? The, the, the vowels usually present the most trouble for people. Um, and once you have the consonants, it's kind of straightforward. But so let's let's make up some words here. We have the de bada, right? The de bada, the de bada. That's not a word. It's nonsense. But we're learning to program our tongue, right? So we or we could have ze the de ga. Ba, right? Ze, the, de, ga, ba. <laughs> it sounds like some Star Wars character. Ze, the, de, ga, ba. Uh, the Degaba system. The Degaba system. Okay. So again, we're just, we're, we're learning to sing this. We're learning to pronounce these. Let's keep going. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, yoda, kappa, Lambda, mu, right? Yoda, kappa, lambda. I'm going to write that kappa a little bit, a little bit better. It's like a little K, basically. It's a little bit hard to write on this screen the way I'm sitting here. Let me try this again. Kappa, right? Kappa. It goes all the way down to the line. Just looks like a little K. It's good to see your professor make tiny mistakes. You say, hey, he's like me, right? Okay, Yoda, kappa, lambda, mu. Notice how this mu is dipping below the line. This Yoda is, in fact, a vowel. It is pronounced either like the E, E, and meet E, or an or like the I and sit. I. If you don't know, just go with the I and sit and I, right? There's several things related to accents and so on that determine which of those it is. 
The cap is pronounced like a K, like the K sound, K. Lambda like an L, a Mu like an M. So you can see a lot of overlap here, very close to English consonants. It makes it easier. So let's just uh, make up some words now. Mi, fe, de, ga, ba, right? Mi, fe, de, ga, ba. <laughs> Mi, fe, de, ga, ba. Okay. They, day, meal, right? They, day, meal. They, day, meal. They, day, meal, right? These are just made-up words. But the point is, you're, you're sounding them out. I recommend to you, again, my website, The Daily Dose of Greek, dailydoseofgreek.com. You can go on there and watch videos where I'm reading thousands of Greek verses, and you can practice reading along with them if that would be helpful. So... Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, yoda, kappa, lambda, mu, nu, xi, omicron, pi. Right, that xi is hard for me to write unless I'm writing it quickly. So it's like boom, 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 boom. And then the curly Q, see how wiggly it is when I try to write it slow to show you? But that's the basically like that. So if I write it slow, it's sort of like that. You're like, why do you write it like that? That's the way my Greek professor taught me to write it at Duke many, many years ago. And that's the standard handwritten way to do it. Sometimes there are slight differences in handwriting. I'm not worried about that. Right? It's not a big deal. Right now it seems like a big deal to three of you. But it's not. Okay, so nu is pronounced like the English N. And you have to watch this because like, the vowel eta looks like an N, but it's a vowel pronounced A. The letter nu looks like a V, but it's the n sound, right? Xi is a x, a ks sound. Omicron is like an aw sound. Aw, aw. It's not an o. It's an aw sound. An aw, aw sound. But you'll notice, because my tongue is from the southeastern United States, there will be a tendency with o vowels for them to shift towards the a. The my omicrons, because I'm human and from the southeastern United States and my tongue is lazy, southern lazy, it will have a tendency when I'm speaking Greek quickly to shift towards, towards the A sound of the vowel. And it's not a big deal. Or it's not a big deal because this, is, this Erasmian pronunciation we're using is a little bit artificial anyway. So it's okay for the vowels to, to, to shift a little bit like that. Okay? And the pi is pronounced like the English uh, American P, like a puh, puh sound. Okay? So let's... let's uh, Again, sing through this, sing through these letters again. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, yoda, kappa, lambda, mu, nu, xi, omicron, pi, rho, sigma, tau, upsilon, right? Rho, sigma, tau, upsilon. Continue to note which, which letters here are dipping below the line. Notice how we wrote that rho as one simple motion like that, rho, rho, right? The rho looks like a p, but it's an r sound. R, r, rho. Sigma is an s sound. It's an s sound, just like a s. Now, sigma, if it occurs in the middle or the beginning of a word, is written this way. But if it occurs at the end of a word, it's written, uh, it's written like this. It's written like an s that just dips below the line slightly, like that. So that's called a final or a terminal sigma when it's the last letter in a word. Then we have a tau, looks like a little T, looks like a little capital T, pronounced like T. Upsilon is a, makes like a oo oo sound, so like an O U sound, upsilon, and that also is a vowel. So let's highlight about upsilon, I highlight vowel omicron. Let's just pronounce the vowels. I, I'm going to underline them in purple here and say them, and you can say them after me or listen. Ah, eh, a, e. Ah, oo, right? Ah, a, a, e, ah, oo. Now the, the the consonants. I guess we can pronounce those as well. B, g, d, z, th, k, l, m, n, x, p, r, s, t. It's kind of hard just to pronounce a consonant by itself, isn't it? It's, you inevitably put some sort of little vowel sound with it. All right, let's sing these again. 
Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, yoda, kappa, lambda, mu, nu, psi, omicron, pi, rho, sigma, tau, epsilon, phi, chi, psi, omega, right? Phi, chi, psi, omega. And you'll notice, I should probably even those up just a tad. Let me fix that. So this does dip below the line, both sides there. So you'll notice there's quite a, the, the phi, the chi, the psi. You can also just pronounce those phi ki psi, right? Sometimes uh, quite a few Greek scholars pronounce them phi ki psi rather than phi chi psi. Either one of those is fine. Um, phi or phi is pronounced like the ph in phone, like a f sound. Chi is um, like a ch, but a little bit of a guttural, like a Christos, like the, the name Christ is Christos, right? And you do like a CH sound, but you sort of like Christmas, but you sort of clear your throat as you do it. The psi or psi is like a ps, like air escaping from your mouth is ps sound. And then omega, that's a vowel, that's a long O sound, like omega, omega. The difference here, omicron is aw, omega is o. Oh, right. You're probably familiar with the capital Omega, right? That either from seeing it in fancy watches or timing in the Olympics or perhaps um, uh, from a Christian bumper sticker, Alpha and Omega, right? That's the capital Omega. It looks, it looks like a horseshoe sort of, but the lowercase Omega looks like a W. And that's one thing you need to watch out for is, is Greek letters that look very similar to English letters. So you just need to work. It's just programming your brain, singing this song, learning how these are pronounced, and sounding them out is, is uh, the, the fundamentals of learning to read the Greek language. We also need to talk about something called diphthongs, okay, diphthongs. What is a diphthong? A diphthong is where you have two vowels that are pronounced as one sound. So when we see this I here, we don't pronounce it ah uh, eh. Right, based on what you've learned so far, you'd say, "Oh, I know that." Ah, uh, eh. Good guess, but this, like in English, uh, for example, in the word "isle," we pronounce that a i, and we pronounce the alpha yoda as an i sound. And so, if you'll see in this little chart drawn from the book, English words have been given which have a similar um, looking combination of vowels, which makes the the Rasmian sound. So. I is pronounced I. Ow, ow is in kraut. A, like A in freight. U, like the EU in feud, like a U sound, U. Oi, like the OI in oil, oi, right, oi. U, like the OU in soup or group, U. And the upsilon yoda, like the UI in sweet, we, we sound, like a, like a we. <laughs> We sound we, so I'm just going to pronounce the the diphthongs going through them. I, ow, a, u, u, or u like a u, u, oi, u, we. You'll notice when you're reading Greek, sometimes you'll have a what you expect to be a diphthong, and one of the letters will have two dots over it. The technical name for those two dots is a diaresis mark. I mispronounced this word for, for a decade. I used to pronounce it diaresis, right? I was like, it looks like diaresis to me. And, uh, and I, I would tell students, you can remember this because diarrhea leaves spots on the toilet. And a diaresis mark leaves spots over your letter. People always like that. But one time I was talking with a colleague of mine. I was like, a, and I just had said a diaresis. He's, uh, a, a, a diaresis. And he goes, uh, do you mean diaresis? And I was like, I guess I do. <laughs> so I looked it up uh, online. I was like, okay, I've been mispronouncing that for 10 years. It's a diaresis, right? A diaresis. It's different from other languages. We'll use two dots over a letter to mean something slightly different. So don't equate this with German or uh, with an umlaut or other things. It's different. In Greek, the two dots means pronounce this vowel distinctly and separately. So this this name, the name of, we would say the name Cain, but in Greek it's pronounced Cain, right? Cain. That Yoda with two dots says, pronounce me as a distinct vowel. Another thing you need to know 
And of course, you're just programming your brain. You're making flashcards. You're saying these over and over again so that you can learn to read Greek. So when you come to that, it's like hooked on phonics. You see that alpha and yoda together. You say, I, your tongue says I, because you programmed your tongue. And your, your eyes see those two letters together, and you know how they're supposed to be pronounced. Greek also has something called breathing marks, right? Greek does not have an H sound except at the beginning of a word. And so if a word has an H sound at the beginning, you would have a rough breathing mark. It looks like a little backwards comma, right? There, there it is, a little backwards comma over the first vowel or diphthong, right? These are all rough breathing marks that I'm highlighting here, right? Hamartia. Hamartia, hepta. You'll notice that I'm adding a little H there. I'm not saying amartia. I'm saying hamartia. Where am I getting that H? I'm getting that H from the rough breathing mark over the first, first vowel. Whenever a Greek word begins with a vowel, right? Whenever a Greek word begins, it can begin with a single vowel. It can begin with a diphthong. It can begin with a capital vowel. It can begin with a a lowercase vowel. Whenever a Greek word begins with a vowel, it will always have a breathing mark. It will either be smooth. So here's an example of smooth breathing marks and where they would be written. Right? It looks just like an apostrophe. And so that would it doesn't affect pronunciation at all. It's just like dotting an I. It really has no meaning at all. So this would be pronounced ah, a, e, e, right? We just we're just it's just a convention in the language. When the word begins with a vowel, you put a, a breathing mark, and smooth breathing mark says don't make an H sound. But if there's a rough breathing mark, as we have in these cases, I guess I'll just use these actual words here, then we do provide an H sound. And you'll also note, as we're beginning to learn how to pronounce Greek words, that you break a Greek syllable, according to Erasmian pronunciation, you break off the syllable as quickly as you can. So, for example, the hamartia, it, because you can break the syllable after the alpha, you do. So it's ha, mar, and if there are two consonants together, usually one goes with one syllable and one with the other, right? If there are two consonants together, one usually goes with one syllable and one with the next. Ha, mar, t, right? Ha, mar, ti, ya. And, the, and we haven't learned accents yet, but the, the, le, the, the vowel that has a little mark over it that you haven't learned yet that will look like this, this, or this, that's the vowel that you say louder and longer. You Boom, you hit it. So it's ha, mar, ti, a. And we try to say the t louder. Ha, mar, ti, a. Ha, mar, ti, a. Ha, mar, ti, a. Right? This one, again, there's, there's, and, and a Greek word has as many syllables as it has vowels or, con or diphthongs. Listen to that. A Greek word has as many syllables as it has vowels or diphthongs, right? A diphthong is just one vowel sound that's two vowels together. So look, this two vowels. So it's going to have two syllables. It's going to be hep, ta, hep, ta, because those two consonants are together. One goes with the first syllable, one goes with the second. Hep, ta. Here we have one, two, three vowels. So, and we break the syllable as quick as we can. So it's hey, me, ra, hey, mera. Hey, mera, that's the word for day. Notice, because all of these words begin with a rough breathing mark, we're providing that H sound, right? Hepta. But we probably got to put the emphasis on the ta. Hepta. Hepta. Hey, mera. Hamartia, right? Hamartia is sin. Hepta, seven. Hey, mera, day. These are just illustrative words. You're not, this is not part of the vocabulary you're memorizing for this chapter. Here we have ha dos, right? Ha dos. Ha dos is the word for way or road. We're trying to do that Omicron like an aw, ah, but it's kind of hard to do sometimes with my southern tongue. But it's ha dos. Ha dos. Here we have who door. Who door, the word for water, are ho zana. Hosanna, Hosanna, which is a transliteration of a, of a Hebrew word. Writing a Hebrew word with Greek letters, that's called transliterating. When you write one word from one language in the letters of another language, that's called transliteration, right? 
And right now, you, you like Greek transliteration. You're like, I like transliteration of Greek. I can read that logos. But soon you're not going to like that. And you're say, I only want to see it like this because it's confusing to me. I don't want to see Greek written with English letters. I want to see Greek written with Greek letters. So very soon you'll be reading logos. And, and you'll be glad about that. Here we have rhema. And some observant students are saying, hey, wait, that begins with a consonant. I thought you said breathing marks were for, for vowels or diphthongs. They are, except for words that begin with the letter rho. If a Greek word begins with the letter rho, it automatically gets a rough breathing mark. And in Erasmian pronunciation, it's essentially silent, right? Rhema, rhema. But um, in the original Greek, it probably communicated that the author was to trill or roll the R like a Scottish, Scottish R. R. <laughs> some sort of a trill or a roll to it, which I am unable to do. So um, you maybe it will help you remember like the English word rhetoric. Notice that H. Where did that come from? Think about it. It comes from the, the Greek word for speakers, rhetor, rhetor. And you can see that silent H uh, right there with that rough breathing mark over the row, rhetor, a speaker, rhetoric. Okay, as we keep going, we have to learn something about accents, right? The oldest manuscripts we have of the New Testament have no accents, right? They have no breathing marks, and they're all capital letters. But accents were developed around 200 B.C. Traditionally, they're ascribed to Aristophanes, Aristophanes of Byzantium, the librarian in Alex, uh, 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 He was a librarian in Alexandria, and apparently he developed this system to help foreigners pronounce Greek because Greek originally was a tonal language with rising and falling pitches and and so the the accents on Greek originally uh, communicated probably tonality the system did like a rising and falling pitch and maybe you know some languages in modern languages have tone like in Chinese and I won't try to write the Chinese character because I can't but the sound ma can be said with a rising ma a falling ma uh, like a loop, ma, or a, a flat tone, ma, right? Ma, 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 ma. Someone who's Chinese who heard that will just, just die laughing because I'm sure I'd said them all wrong. But if you ask a Chinese person, say ma in the different tones, they'll say them very rapidly. And the word means mother, rope, uh, scold, and horse. That same word, just depending on the, the tone that you use with it. Well, Greek was not that radical with tones. But tones were part of the language, but probably by the time of the New Testament, it, it had lost tonality, and the accents just meant stress. So it means you say that syllable a little bit louder and a little bit longer. So, for example, for the word agape, you say agape, agape. You try to put a little punch on the accented syllable. Or for, for the word head here, kephale, it's kephale. Cafale, and you could you can do this so dramatically that you sound like a fool, and we don't want to do that. We don't want to, but we we do want to try to place emphasis on the on the accented syllable, cafale, cafale, and the circumflex here, which can be written differently depending on if it's like some some typed forms, it looks like this. But usually in hand handwriting in Greek, it looks just like a like a little house top like that. So sa phone, right? Sophon, it comes from the Greek word sophos, meaning wise, but sophon, sophon. So trying to emphasize that a little louder, a little bit longer, the accented uh, syllable. And you can see there are three accents in Greek. There's no different, and, and, and for our purposes, we, we just stress them, right? Because there's no tonality. So we, we don't say them, we don't stress them in any way differently. But you should know the names of them. There's the acute which is like that. And you can remember that because it's like you're starting to write the word acute. First thing I write when I write acute is the beginning of the A, and it looks like an acute accent. The grave, which you can think it's sliding down to the grave. It's like someone's sliding down to the grave. Boom. And the circumflex, which looks like a little curly Q or a little, or a little housetop. And uh, the textbook has some more of the rules related to accents, we were uh, remembering the Apostle Paul didn't use accents. The oldest manuscripts don't have accents. We will um, note accents where they affect meaning. And there are a few words where, where the accent choice, the, the editors of the Greek New Testament have made a choice 
affecting the meaning of the word. Just for example, the word tis means anyone, but the word tis means who. So to, uh, this accented form does have a different meaning from this. So in those few cases where that, that, that's the situation, we will note that. Let's also say something about punctuation, and I think this will wrap it up for the chapter. Just a little word about punctuation. Again, the oldest manuscripts we have do not have any punctuation. And then in the first few centuries, sometimes it's quite erratic and, and hard to determine what the uh, scribe meant by the markings that they have in their page. But this is the system of punctuation that's pretty standard in critical editions of the Greek New Testament. If you see something that looks like a period, well, it is. It's essentially the same as an English period. A comma is communicating the same thing as an English comma. Remember, these are editorial decisions. These are not present in the oldest and best manuscripts. These are, these are things that have been added, interpretive decisions by editors to help us read the text more easily. But you should always keep in the back of your mind realizing um, these, are, these are not in some original written by Paul or John. These are editorial decisions and can be discarded if the context favors so. If you see a raised dot, that's not something we're usually used to seeing in English. It's, a, it's essentially functioning like an English semicolon. You say, I don't use semicolons. What's a semicolon? Well, between the, the, between the discourse break of a comma and a period is, is a semicolon, right? It's stronger than a comma, but not as strong as a period. So if you think about that as a continuum, letting us know, is a thought completed? Is a thought paused? It's somewhere between a, com a pause and a completion there. And then if you see something that looks like a semicolon in your Greek text, that is actually the question mark. And remember, this is, uh, these are interpretive decisions, and sometimes, um, sometimes you'll see English translations that will disagree whether a, a statement is a question or whether it's an assertion. Well, you have your work cut out for you, don't you? Learning the alphabet, learning the diphthongs, the breathing marks, the accents, the punctuation. There's no shortcut. Right? It's hard work, but it's worth it. It's worth it. You're doing it to learn to read the inspired words of the apostles. May God give you strength and joy in this task.